Meeple Nation Podcast, Episode 495, Meeple Nation, October 2023 News. Welcome, citizens, to Meeple Nation. Grab your favorite beverage, pull up a chair, warm up those dice, and join us at the game table as we discuss board games and the board gaming world. Each week, the hosts of Meeple Nation share their love for board games and the amazing memories that come from playing games with some very outstanding people. Let us now join our hosts in their natural habitat, the game table. The Meeple Nation podcast is sponsored by GameToppersLLC.com. We absolutely love our Game Toppers. We use them for every game night. They are absolutely fantastic. Convert any table or surface into an epic gaming table. They have a whole bunch of extra little accessories and things that mount and snap on. Military grade aluminum, some of the best mats on the market. Probably the best mats on the market, especially from an art standpoint. And I have to say, I don't know what we'd do without them. They're fantastic. So go check them out. Make your game night epic and amazing. GameToppersLLC.com. New Kickstarter is going to be starting pretty soon. I know. I'm excited. Have you seen the mats he's been teasing? Yeah, those mats are amazing. They are fantastic. Yeah, there's going to be some, some, hopefully some new mats coming our way. There definitely will be coming mine. (laughs) (laughs) We are the hosts of Meeple Nation. I'm Nathan Howard. I'm Logan Howard. I'm Andy Holiday, And I am Douglas Stewart. Glad you are all here. If you have some free time while you're on the internet, wander over to MeepleNation.com. We have what we would like to consider a very nice website. There are links to all of our past episodes. There are links to our social media photos. There's links to our blogs and there's some links to the bios of us and some of our bloggers. You can also email us with any questions at meeplenation at gmail.com. And while you're at our website, feel free to peruse that Patreon link where you can join up and be a patron of the Meeple Nation podcast. We love our patrons and we appreciate their support and their love for the podcast as as we grow and try to develop new things and try to get some more bonus content out there. We have some uh, early access to those and we're hopefully going to have some additional bonus content coming soon. If you want to get to that access, we would love for our patrons to be there. Speaking of MeepleNation at gmail.com, we got an email from our friend Ben Stein. He reported that, hey, I just uh, I enjoyed the latest episode today, and I think you reminded us that we as listeners can suggest games for you to play, which, yes, Ben, you are totally right. You can totally suggest games for us to play. There's no guarantee on whether we'll play them or not, but we would love it if people would suggest a way. Yes, for sure. Ben goes on, he says, one of my favorites is the movie-making game Roll Camera, and I thought you might enjoy it if you ever play it. I would love to hear your impressions and maybe even an episode of on top five movie-making or movie-themed games would be a fun one. Best wishes, Ben. So uh, I looked at this game. This game actually looks pretty fun. It's a one to six player game. Uh, plays in 45 to 90 minutes. And it's, it's all about your movie producers and a failing production company. And you're trying to make one last successful movie to save your firm. Uh, so it's, it's kind of fun. It has all sorts of neat stuff. The only drawback I have is the game is not readily available. There's one site out there that has it for 95 bucks. Ooh, and that's just for the base game. Although you can wander, wander over to Key Bean Studios, where they actually have it for 45 bucks, 50 bucks, uh, or you can spend the, the same price as the other place, and it will include the Roll Camera B Movie expansion, the Roll Camera Metallic or Metal Dice upgrade, the Roll Camera B Movie Wooden Token upgrade, and the B Movie Surprise promo. So uh, if we're going to consider it at all. We're going to consider that option. <laughs> we we are suckers for upgraded components. Yeah. Well, and for the for this price to be the same as uh, the other website's regular price for just the base game, this sounds like the way to go. So, Ben, we'll have to uh, consider if we can find it elsewhere. We'll see if we can get it to the table. Otherwise, uh, uh, we'll have to look for it at a convention or something. We are going to 
some of us are going to BGG this November, so maybe we can see if it is in their library there. Because, Andy, both your girls are going, and this may be something that they will enjoy more than you. I don't know. Maybe. It might be fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep an open mind. I would love to play it. I think it sounds fun. Yeah, I was I was just looking at it while we were talking about it, and it, yeah, it looks very intriguing, really fun. I actually really love this suggestion to do a movie-themed games list. Yeah, I, I, I like that idea a lot. Yeah, because because I, I know we all have some on the shelf. There's some good ones. Actually, making a list and talking about what our favorite ones would be really fun. Oh, for sure. So thanks, Ben. We appreciate that feedback, and that is something that we will try to arrange for sure. As we just discussed, I think the top five movie-themed game uh, could be something that we get to sooner than later. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. Also, we had Arcane Wonders send us a a little box of goodies. We were super excited. We were all kind of here when Nathan opened that box up and pulled out Furnace with the expansion Interbellum and Dice Manor and Neotopia. And we had a chance to play all of these games this last week, some multiple times. Boy, that was a fun box to get in the mail. It was fun. I enjoyed all three of these games. I didn't get a chance to play the Furnace uh, expansion with the Interbellum, but playing the base games, I I enjoyed all three of these, and I look forward to playing them again for sure. I think Furnace was a huge hit. We played that one quite a bit over this past week. Yeah, I think in the last week I've logged four or five plays of that, and, and it was really good. We only threw the expansion in the one time, and I absolutely loved it. That's one of those where I would probably just keep the expansion in all the time. Um, but what a fantastic game. Furnace is wonderful. And if you like engine building style games and sort of resource management, it's mostly engine building. But if there, there's some other like little things like it has some it has some uh, bidding, but the bidding is really more like worker placement. Um, and then you it's mostly just uh, man, just trading lots of resources in for other resources and then trying to generate some cash and outscore your opponents. Engine building's probably the key element in there for sure. Oh, yeah. When I was told uh bidding i was like uh really but then when we sat down to play it it was like such a light part of the game like yeah it, it's such a fantastic game i love the uh engine building aspect of it and it has that short play time which was great too because you could get yeah. that to the table again and again because the first night we played it we played it three times here at the table or just twice? Yeah, I would think it's twice, but still, yeah. And, and it was really fast. That was with uh, four and five players too, which kind of surprised me. It actually says in the rule book, we don't recommend doing this with five players. I think it was fine with five players. I didn't find that there was a problem with that at all. The only thing I would say against that would be with the expansion. It does add that level of complexity that with five players, if you're looking for a quicker game, that's not it. That, that is true, because at that point, it is just going to be a, uh, that's going to be probably the game you play mm-hmm. for, for game night, or at least one of the main games you play for game night. So I think, I do think with the expansion and with additional players, you cross that threshold from being filler into, you know, full game. But uh, either way, it was really fun. Yeah, it's still fantastic. So we also got the chance to play Dice Manor. Uh, Dice Manor was actually one that I had kickstarted. So we had a, a nice Kickstarter version of that. Dice Manor was one that uh, our first play, we had some unintentional cheating that maybe kind of left a bad taste in your mouth, Doug. It did. But uh, the second time I've played this game, it's a very easy game to teach and to learn. Uh, to master, it takes a little bit uh, more than one play. Yeah, scoring is actually quite nuanced and deciding when you're going to place those dice into your manor in particular and how you build your manor out for sort of the final grand tour really matters. And it almost takes a game to kind of grok that and figure out how that's going to work because I definitely didn't understand it and I would have taken different tiles if I'd fully understood it. So it it is a simple game, but there's some emerging complexity there for sure. Yeah. The last time I played it, we taught it to a bunch of our hug friends, and they they all very much enjoyed it as well. There was still some nuance. I think Sierra played with us, Andy. Everybody else had a much larger mansion than uh, than uh, than she did. She it was just uh, going back to what you said, Doug. That is just one of those things where you quickly realize that you need to make sure you're bidding on those rooms to add those rooms to your mansion and uh, not get left behind. Because if you're not doing that, that definitely hinders your score. Yeah, I didn't realize the 
how important those question mark rooms where you could place any die on on that room, how powerful those were at the end of the game. Um, just not really understanding exactly how the that final tour went. And it's definitely, I would completely agree with you guys. It's one that you play once to figure out exactly how the game works. And then really you'd have to play it again before you really can have a, a strong opinion one way or the other for it. Yeah. Cause I mean, those question mark rooms are what uh, really what they allow you to do is when you're doing your uh, grand opening or even when you're doing tours during the earlier four rounds, those question mark rooms allow you to put any die in there. And if you can get the opportunity to put two, three, four dice out there, that really enhances your score yeah. and gives you a, gives you those bonus points more often than not having those for sure. Yeah. I was right there with you and Monique um, score wise until that final round. And then you guys flew way past me because of the, the tour. A lot of that was, I couldn't roll. I mean, I was rolling everything I didn't need instead because they're D6s. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was funny. You would roll all unique numbers, like yep. almost all e the time. Every yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. The first roll, you'd have some dubl some doubles. You'd have some duplicates there. But uh, yeah, when you needed duplicates towards that last round, it was just, it was all unique numbers. Actually, I think all three of these games are going to be fun for, these are games I'm going to take to my wife and right. give her the opportunity to play. But I think that's something that for me makes a game makes a game shine even more is if it's something that I can play on a regular game night and something that I can take and play with my wife on a uh, when it's just her and I that's great. But let's talk about uh, Neotopia. That's uh, the last one that's on our list. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. This is a tile laying game, and there are three regions that you play tiles on, and you're trying to fill patterns based on the cards that are in your hand. And you're going to score points if you can fulfill those patterns. It's very simple. Reading through the rules, and it's a really, really simple, quick teach. I guess I wasn't expecting to have as much fun as we did. I had a lot of fun. I thought it was great. Yeah, I was really excited to uh, see the end score. Because there's three regions on the board, and you're going to score the points of your highest scoring region plus the points of your second highest score region. And then in that third region, you're going to take whatever that score is and multiply it by three and then add those together. And we were all kind of thinking, oh, that's kind of a lame thing. But after playing and seeing how scores leveled out, I actually really like this mechanic. I thought in our game, the last game that we played, we had two people at 67 and uh, 66 me and, and 64. Yeah. And so I came in last place at 64 and a game that I thought I was the whole last part of the game. I thought, oh man, I'm so out of this. And to have that still come up and be so close, I thought it was very well done. Uh, Doug, you made mention of the tactileness of this game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, think think Azul actually. Only instead of the square starburst tiles, they're they're circular, but it has very much that same tactile feel, and I loved it. You know, you got the board out there, very colorful and bright, uh, but not like the cheesy version of colorful and bright. If you if you know what I mean. I mean, there's some games that are just way overdone. This has the right brights in the right spots, and then it has kind of the subdued tones around the edge of the board, um, and then these really thick, nice acrylic tiles. And I, I thought it was a real pleasure to play. I, it kind of, it creates a really fun puzzle for players. So there's enough to really kind of bite down into, but it wasn't overly complicated and it didn't take uh, too long to play, even with the uh, full player count, which was four players. Yeah. I really enjoy games that have like, I don't think I would call this necessarily a catch up mechanic, but I do like those like balancing mechanisms. I think that would be a better way to describe it in this game where it was yeah. uh, instead of the hyper focusing, because the entire game, I felt like I was so far behind, but then I ended up like tying for the, at one of the 67s and it was just like, oh, holy crap. Like I did that well, like, oh wow. But like all of us, like the point score was like so close. It, I, I thought that was amazing. You did have an epic last turn though. It, so it, agreed. Agreed. That definitely helped. But yeah, it was a great game. I loved it. It was fun. In lieu of uh, our regular weekly highlights, let's just go with those three games as kind of our group highlights. Well, and it's actually interesting you say that, Nathan, because in, in the notes, I had put Furnace. I yeah, was like, I okay, well, if, we, if we're not talking about the Arcane Wonders box, I want to talk about Furnace because I was really excited about it. But so I'm glad we talked about the games they sent us because that was super cool. All three really amazing games. And uh, I, that's all I was going to talk about was Furnace. So yeah, I think I think we're good. Yeah. We'll just move on to maybe some of our our news highlights. Who wants to go first? Games that are new releases. 
So I'll, I'll start us off here. So actually, um, I was pretty excited about the Lord of the Rings adventure to Mount Doom. So this is a game that just released. And this is basically a Lord of the Rings themed game in a lightweight kid friendly package. And I think, you know, I was looking at some of the reviews and some of the early impressions and stuff like that. And I think that this uh, this is a game that there's a lot of people out there who thought it was going to be more than it is. And there's been just a little bit of disappointment in that. I think if you go into it with the right mindset, though, which is I'm going to have an awesome adventure in Middle Earth with probably a little younger audience, then this game looks fantastic. And I just got this one. It's sitting in shrink. It's on the shelf. I just put it on the shelf. Um, So I'm really excited to bust this out and get it played. What I'm excited about, uh, the a recent pickup for us, too, is a game called Wandering Towers. This is a two to six player game, plays in about 30 minutes. The premise of the game is each year the graduating class of Raven Realm Magic School competes to demonstrate their mastery of magic. For the final exam, all wizards of each class must assemble at the legendary Raven's Keep. But the last one of them has procrastinated, distracted by learning new spells. They've also used up all their potions. And they can't show up unprepared with empty potion bottles. So the game is set up in kind of a big loop. And you have pieces that uh, will connect all the, uh, that connects the loops. And so these are places that you're going to possibly stop on the way. So the goal of the game is that you want to get all of your wizards or your meeples into the Raven's Keep Tower. And so to get them in there, you have to be able to drop them in there with exact movement, right? So you can't overshoot it. You have to be able to end your turn right on there to drop your wizard in there. Uh, the game is called Wandering Towers because the the last wizard that showed up unprepared has empty potions. And so in order to fill those potions, they're going to be causing some of the towers to move as well. A little bit more than the first half of the the loop has little cardboard towers on there and all the wizards will be sitting on top of there. You're going to play a card from your hand and the cards can either move your wizard, move a tower, and some of them can even do both. But when you move a tower and you're going to put that tower on top of another tower and so possibly you're going to be capturing wizards under there, maybe even some of your wizards under there, but each wizard that gets put under there is one, not going to be able to move until that tower is moved, but it's also going to help you fill up your potions. As you're completing this race, you're going to want to be able to fill up all of your potions, depending on the number of players is how many potions you have. And then also, depending on the number of players is how many wizards you have to get into that black tower. Very simple game, but I really love the mechanics of it's a race game, but yet you're going to be able to throw roadblocks on your opponents by essentially trapping them in the tower and forcing them to to move that tower. But a clever little game. I'm looking forward to pulling this off the shelf and uh, getting it to the table. So that's Wandering Towers. Are you, are you getting a copy of this? I have a copy of this. Oh, awesome. Okay. And the, and the first expansion, the Magic. It's a mini spell expansion. Very cool. No, I'm excited about this. Real lightweight. 1.63. Yeah. So, so easy. This isn't, uh, this isn't like a real complex brain burning game, but simple mechanics. And it does look really fun. The components on it look really cool too. The tower stacking is a fun element, I think. So another one I will make just really quick mention of is, uh, Decrypto, AKA the game I can't teach. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Decrypto. This is the five year anniversary edition. So I think this is a really, really great party game. Um, we've talked about it a little bit in the past. They just released a fifth anniversary edition. Really, it's mostly just kind of a new look on the cover. It's the black box edition. Um, it looks like they have just a few minor kind of component and art upgrades as well. So it's it's the same game that has always existed. I don't think there's any new expansions or rules or content or anything like that. But this looks like a pretty sleek kind of finish on a really great game. And with this new printing, it's now you know readily available and people should definitely go check this game out. Decrypto is super fun. All right. So everybody knows that I'm a bit of a sucker for pirate games. No way. It's serious. It's pirate games and dungeon crawls, right? Well, I finally got my Kickstarter for Davy Jones Locker, the Kraken Wakes. Actually, we've had it, I've had it for about a month or so. And we've gotten this to the table and I've had a lot of fun. This is a cooperative game. Uh, it's rated 8.7 on BGG. The weight is 2.67, which is... That's probably pretty close. Um, but this, this is one where you have two sides of the board. There's two different phases of the game. You are going from sailing around, going from port to port, going to uh, Smuggler's Den in the middle of the board, trying to upgrade your ship. You can hunt down treasure ships. 
to get extra treasure. You can try to to explore the sunken different sunken ships around the map. Anyway, for that entire first part of the game, you're working together to try to get everybody's ship upgraded because once the next phase triggers, you immediately flip the board over and everyone's fighting the Kraken. You have tentacles spawning throughout the board. The, there's a whirlpool that's pulling your ships in and out and around the board, all the while you're trying to defeat the tentacles that are attacking you and trying to defeat the Kraken at the same time. They've done a really good job. I think one of my favorite elements of this game is while you're fi fighting the Kraken, your ship has a potential to sink and get to where you, you're as far as fighting with your own ship, you're out of the game. However, you put a little deck hand on the board and your guys are floating around the whirlpool that can be rescued. And once you're rescued, where once you sink, you flip your, your board over and there are extra actions you can take as a deckhand. And as soon as you're rescued, then you are now helping whoever rescued you get by giving them bonuses or using their cannons to attack and so on. So I love the fact that yes, your ship can sink, but you're not out of the game. In fact, that last game we played over, over the last weekend, it came down to the wire three of the four of us had sunk and we were on the one ship that was the weakest ship of the, all of all four ships and we managed to pull it off together defeat the kraken by the skin of our teeth it was the very last round we had four turns to defeat the kraken and we defeated him on the second turn but it's a great game we've had fun i think we've played it three times it's been four times we've played it four times and have had a ball all four times if you like pirate games this is a great one i've had a lot of fun with it I got to play the one time a couple of weeks back. I very much enjoyed Davy Jones's Locker. Yeah, it was a good one. That was one that, once again, I backed because it was a pirate game and it looked fun. And thankfully, it, it was. It was. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I have another one. Uh, this is Fika. And Fika is a clever coffee break game. This is a two player game, it's a 20 minute game. The art on it looks really good. In Fika, you're a street cafe owner trying to out-earn the competitor. You're skillful, skillfully arranging your cards in your own cafe and manipulating those cards on the board, trying to uh, draw customers from your opponent's board to uh, from your opponent's side of the board to your side. So it kind of has a feel of Lost Cities. You have the table in the middle, and you're each playing cards on the other side of that, but. Unlike Lost Cities, you're going to be able to have that opportunity to draw customers from the other side. And you're trying to, uh, and the scoring is nothing like Lost Cities, but you're trying to arrange patterns on your side of the building, trying to make your customers happy. The game is, I mean, and 20 minute game, but this is one that I'm looking forward to playing with my wife. I love the two player game, kind of that head on competition and just being able to battle each other in a very short game. But that is Fika, a clever coffee break game. Okay, I do have one. Zombicide Iron Maiden. An Iron Maiden themed expansion for Zombicide? Yes. Wow. Tell me more. Yeah, they have a like three packs for it, so it's just iconic members of the band and uh, the iconic mascot along with the figures. The pack includes material to use them and in numerous games in various ways. With a Zombicide Second Edition, uh, you can use it with the Black Plague Invader and undead or alive as well as rising sun zombicide like i they're just doing so many different things with it i don't know like what's left with zombicide what are they going to do barbie meeple nation it wouldn't surprise me meeple nation either one of those meeple, Na meeple nation zombicide i like that idea yeah That's, i like that i That's, could support that we, we <laughs> should pitch it to them <laughs> they're gonna start running out of ips to to hit so yeah we better get on that bandwagon I get to pick my weapons. So does the Marvel <laughs> Zombies, it doesn't work with Zombicide at all, right? It's it's a completely different... It is completely different. It plays very similar, but it is very different. Okay. Yes, and Hulk was awesome. Hulk was awesome. He yes. did some serious smashing. Oh, man. Yeah. I did enjoy Iron Man as well. Yeah, that's one I want to I wanna play, so I'm glad uh, both of you are getting it, yeah. And then you're getting all the X-Men stuff with it, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sticking to the base for now, but I really enjoyed it. It was very good. Oh, I look forward to playing it. It does seem like they have more and more of these little expansions that Logan's talking about coming out. I mean, every time I check, there's a new little pack of something you can play with. And I, I, I kind of love that. I, they're not all for me, but I kind of love that they're, they, they dip their toes in so many different arenas, right? And uh, I think probably my favorite was the Thundercats. We played the Thundercats yep. with uh, Zombicide. Was that Black Plague? Yeah, it was, it was Black, Black Plague. Plague. Yeah. yeah, and that was really fun. <laughs> it was kind of a fun blast from the past. Heavens, yes, that was a, that was a ton of fun. I look forward to trying the game again. 
Any, has anybody here ever had like had a dream of being a prehistoric chief? Nathan, I think you probably have all the time. You know, I've I've had a lot of dreams. Uh, I've had dreams of being a robot or making sure robots can dream. But no, tell me more of this prehistoric wait, dreams. Wait, wait, wait! You had a dream of making sure robots could dream. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Stay tuned. You might hear about it later. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a prehistoric chief in the game Elawa, you get to assemble your members, tools, huts, and stocks in order to try to beat out the other chieftains of the other tribes. You assemble your prehistoric tribe by collecting elements necessary for development. The opposing, opposing chiefs are going to be trying to outwit you, and they will do you no favors. The table is set up around a campfire. And there are resources around the campfire and cards. Um, so you'll get to take a card from the campfire, you add it to your tribe face up, and you get any resources that are that are displayed on the card. And it's all based on player count. If you when you take the last resource from the stack, you're going to it's going to trigger the end of the game. Now this has set collection and resource management in it. There's resource queue, and it's only a 30 minute game. It seems like it's going to be kind of a fun game. I, I don't think any of us have this. Not but, currently. But I do like the fact I you know more and more. I'm liking these 30 to 45 minute games that just play really quickly. And most of the time that's just because it's nice to change players up. We usually get at least two tables going, at least on our Friday night game night. And it's kind of fun to get players switched up. And some of those short games make it a little more convenient to, to, to be able to do that. Unless there's someone at the other table I don't want to play with. And then I want to play a three hour game. <laughs> I'm sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Now I was just going to say, cause I was looking at it 1.29 on the weight scale. So another one of these light games that very much looks filler, but also looks really good. So, and I, and I totally agree. I think every collection needs a handful of those types of games uh, for, you know, a variety of situations. Yeah. I mean, just, I think about how often Ohanami gets to my, gets to my table, which is very often and all these little lightweight games, and they are, they just are kind of a, hey, we have a few minutes, let's just play this game, or let's, you know, we've got, oh, how much does that table have left? Oh, 30 minutes? Okay, we'll, we'll pull this quick game out. And it is really nice to have some variety on those, because that's one thing I'm I'm kind of short on in my game room, or these these filler games, so. Yeah, this one even looks like it might be okay to travel with. Throw this in your backpack or something and, and take it when you're on the road. I like it. Well, that sounds like fun. I mean, it kind of reminds me, I mean, when you first started off, it reminded me of Endless Winter Paleo-Americans, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't play like that at all. So this would be a fun one. And you talk about those shorter games. I mean, I think we have more of an issue where uh, people don't all show up at the same time, right? These shorter games gives us some, give us something to kind of start the night off with before we hit into something that's maybe a little bit more meatier. So... This would be a great pickup. Yeah, that's awesome. And then one more that I wanted to make a quick mention of. This is uh, Three Ring Circus. Uh, this is a game by David Turtsey, and this is getting a little bit of, of buzz. I've been hearing about this a little bit. Um, don't know a whole lot about it, but it looks really fun. Basically, it's a, a circus-themed hand management kind of area majority game where each player is um, leading their own circus, essentially, on a tour through the United States. And so you're trying to build up your circus. You kind of start weak. You've got to buy, you know, your different, uh, you know, your acrobats and your sideshows and all this kind of stuff. You upgrade your circus and then you take it around and you're trying to sort of meet the demands of different locations. So, you know, Chicago may want a strong man where Denver wants a, you know, an acrobatic act or something like that. So you need to take your circus on the, on the places where they'll meet the most demand and then uh, score it up at the end of the game. It looks really intriguing. The art looks really fun. I like the circus theme. Um, I don't think that uh, at least I haven't really played a lot of circus themed games and the, the one or two that I have have been not, not great games. So I'm excited about this. I, this is one I'd like to, to check out at some point, but three ring circus looks pretty good. All right. To get back to your question, Logan, can robots dream? Well, in the game Mecha Dream, that is exactly what you're trying to find out. In the future, robots and humans are living together in cohesity. No Terminator type uh, evolution or destruction, but uh, you're working in a workshop and you're trying to implant dreams into your robots. And so this is a unique kind of tile placing game. You're trying to come up with equipment and uh, dreams that are going to be able to work for your robots. You're, you're making your robots happy because you got to support them just to make sure that they don't turn against you. Make sure that they can have a good night's sleep too. 
Is, that, is that all it takes for us to avoid that scenario? I Just think make sure so. The robots, our, our robot overlords, get a good night's rest. Yes. Yeah. It, it's yeah. why I say please and thank you to my phone. And apparently in the future, they don't have snicker bars, so you just can't give them a Snickers bar to tell them they're hangry. So you have to you have to make sure they can dream. But this is fun, and this does have a implementation on BGA, so you can go try it there too. Sweet. I'm going to talk about War Game. I know War Games are not necessarily our favorites, but this one just seemed so unique to me. On the podcast, we talk about player count quite a bit, and I thought this was just such a cool thing to do with the game. So DEFCON 1, it takes place in, in the, during the Cold War in the 1950s, from 1950 to 1990. All the cards and, te- and the technologies are all based in history. The cool thing about it is the gameplay is dependent on how many players you have. So if there are two players, you're playing the Frontal Shock game and that's nervous and tense. If you're three players, you're playing the Death Circle game with secret objectives. With four players, it's semi-cooperative game with secret objectives. And at five players, it's just secret objectives. But then you have, all of them are going to be asymmetrical. All of them have their own tech trees. All of them have just something that is completely different depending on your player count. So it's almost like five different games that you're playing depending on how many players you have at the table. Anyway, it, it sounds really cool. As far as war games are concerned, it sounds neat. It would be fun to try. Uh, but this one releases in September. So this is like brand, brand new. Be interesting to, to give this a shot. I, I kind of like that idea of the, the game changing every time you play the game, depending on player count. I like that. So speaking of war games, I'll just leave it at that. We'll see what happens next week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What a transition. What a teaser. All right. So now let's jump to some game announcements. Some new games that are out there in the ether still, not quite yet tangible. Okay. So I have one that's kind of interesting. So website that... You've you've sold it already. I know. I know. A website that Doug actually pointed me to when I started 3D printing is Loot Studios. They have some gorgeous figures. Their prints are amazing. I love them. Well... They actually have a new board game that they've teased, which is called Relics Untold. It's kind of a hybrid between a living card game and a war game. So you're going to have to like print your own army. The living living card game version, I guess, comes from like the army that they're going to print from like their monthly figures that are coming out or something like that. As I'm reading, as they like come out with like new information and they have lore that's coming out with the game and everything too, is that you have to have a 3D printer to be able to play the game. Yeah, but it just seems really interesting that they're trying to like bridge that gap of like having a 3D printer and those war games and stuff like that by themselves. So I'm not that I'm interested in a living card game because I... My wallet does not want me to do that, but <laughs> I, I, I like the concept of bridging that gap between yeah, those two. Yeah, for sure. I think this is kind of a cool and, and fun thing for them to do. I mean, in, in order to avoid very obvious copyright restrictions, they have a lot of their, their files that they create are very adjacent to things you'd find in either Dungeons and Dragons or Star Wars or Star Trek or, you know, that kind of thing. And so I think it's kind of fitting that they're actually sort of creating their own lore and their own sort of world, um, you know, that they can sort of explain some of these creatures that they've made and have a place for them to sort of live and have stories and, and, and all that. You know, if, if I had hundreds and hundreds of these files out and, and, you know, subscribers and everything, they really do make some of the best minis. Um, at least as far as STL files go, some of the best that are out there. And so, you know, to create this world around those, I think is, is natural and, and cool. Uh, we'll, we'll see how good the gameplay is, you know, that, that will really determine whether this is successful in the long run, but I'm intrigued by this. This is kind of a cool idea and a cool thing that they're engaged in. So we're getting close to Halloween. So I've got a couple of Halloween games I want to talk about. Sounds exciting. And the first one is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre game. This is a semi-cooperative game that naturally you're driving down the road and you run out of gas. So what do you do? You run into the woods and try to find gas and some keys. Because and that's where all the gas is. Absolutely. Naturally. And you get chased around by a psychopathic murderer yeah, with a chainsaw. I mean. Makes sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. And it, at that point, I you know I don't know if it's going to be a bear chase where you just have to be the, the you know, be faster than the, the slowest person. But the components actually are kind of cool. There's a component bag that is 
like it looks like random pieces of leather stitched together because it's Leatherface, right? Is the main villain for the te- Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Anyway, looks like it's uh, they're trying to stay true to the movie and I guess jump in and play this when it comes out and make really bad decisions and try not to get killed. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess one person is playing Leatherface and the other three players are uh, trying to find that gas tree in the forest. It does not have the one versus many mechanism. So I am not necessarily sure about that. I think it may have a, it's a semi-cooperative probably because some people can lose the game is my guess. You probably can get killed. So if, if you get caught, you go to the kill room to Leatherface's kill room and you have three turns or three actions to try to get out. And I think if you don't get out, then I, I, there might be some player elimination. It doesn't necessarily say that on the mechanisms, but there is a pressure luck element to it as well. So it could be interesting. Hmm. That sounds interesting. It sounds very Logan-y. Uh, yes, I am very intrigued. One that has my interest is a new game. It's a two-player game, and it is called Sky Team. Apparently, this episode, I am talking all about two-player games. But this is really short. plays in 15 minutes. So Sky Team is a cooperative two-player game where you have just the two of you and you're trying to play as pilot and co-pilot at the controls of an airliner. Your goal is to work together as a team to land your airplane in different airports. The whole theme is a little bit uh, kind of different for me, but uh, it's there's a lot of dice rolling, so this is, has your name all over it, Andy. <laughs> but uh, to land your plane, you need to silently assign your dice in the correct space in your cockpit to balance the axis of your plane, control its speed, deploy the flaps, extend the landing gear, contact the control tower to clear your path, and even have a little coffee to improve your concentration enough to change the value of your dice. So maybe you could, with some dice manipulation, Andy... Maybe you could enjoy this. This does sound a little better now, the longer you go. (laughs) So you don't want your plane to tilt too far. You don't want to forget to put out those landing gear or uh, even collide with other planes. But Sky Team, fun little uh, two-player game, 15 minutes. I think this is going to be a no-brainer pickup for me. Yeah, this is another one that's been generating a little bit of buzz. And I think it's pretty well-liked. BGA has it at an 8.4 complexity rating of uh, 2.0. So I think it's right in that little sweet spot for a two-player uh, cooperative game. And kind of a fun theme, right? Like we're just trying to land a plane. And if we don't, yep. we die. I mean, yeah. we just wreck and everyone's dead. Kind of like real life. Kind of like real life. Yeah, if the pilot can't <laughs> land the plane. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's how that works. Well, I've got one that, uh, Nathan, you might have a little interest in. It. Me, not quite as much. This game didn't grab my attention quite as much as I think it did yours. This is 3,000 Scoundrels which has been out for a while and, right. and we've played it and, and I, I liked it. There were things that I, that I really liked about it. There were some things that kind of bothered me. Um, and, and overall it was a, it was a fine game, but this is 3000 scoundrels double or nothing. And this introduces new technologies to the game. It doubles the number of scoundrels, which so in my, there's 6,000. Yeah. Which in my opinion was kind of one of the coolest things about this game, right? Was the, all those different combos that you could put together. Um, and create throughout the course of, of playing the game. And then it introduces a new solo mode for people who may want to play this solo. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Uh, 3000 Scoundrels is a game I enjoyed, but it's not one that's been pulled off the shelf a lot. So maybe a good expansion would give us a new opportunity to play that again and be able to uh, experience those 6000 Scoundrels. Nice. I'm in. So my other Halloween game. You guys ready for this? I'm ready. It's Halloween. Based on the movie Halloween. Mike so Myers. A, oh, okay. Mike Myers. So this is a one versus many. Okay. So, so one player is going to be playing Mike Myers. Everybody else is playing is going to be playing characters from the movie. And you're going to be running around trying to find the two lost kids and keys to get away. That's what you're trying to do. And in order to win, you need to, to be able to either do enough damage to Mike Myers to defeat him or successfully escape. Mike Myers, on the other hand, just needs to kill enough people to win. And this isn't, there's no player elimination with this. If you get killed, you just come into the game with and spawn as a new character from the movies and you just keep playing and trying to, trying to beat the one person playing Mike Myers. Anyway, it looks interesting. Honestly, this, uh, so there's, you, you, there's hidden movement. Mike Myers can't be seen unless you're looking directly at him. So he's an ever posing threat because you're not quite sure where he is at any given time unless you see him and then boom, he's, he could be right in front of you. Right. So it sounds interesting. It sounds like there may be an element of anxiety 
Maybe I, more I like so. This. Maybe more so than with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, just because you have that unknown element where boom, Mike Myers pops up right in front of you. You're like, holy crap! I think that sounds kind of kind of fun. It may be one of those one versus many that could be really enjoyable. Yeah, I mean, this I'm intrigued. Halloween is not one of my go to movies by any means. Mine either. And uh, the only thing that would make this better is maybe if it had a Shia LaBeouf version. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Well, <laughs> what if I told you the publisher was Trick or Treat Studios? That seems very fitting. It does seem very fitting for sure. Yeah. I'm I'm actually kind of surprised there aren't more of these one versus many style games that revolve around you know, horror or, or you know, one person is just out to murder the others. You yeah. know, we see this in a lot of the, the more dungeon crawly type, type games. Um, but just uh, more of a Halloween or horror theme, it does surprise me we don't see more of this type of thing. You would want another person, right? You would want a person behind that. Absolutely. Out trying to get you, not instead of an AI or an automa or something like that. Yeah, for sure. I think that would make it way more fun and way just the anxiety levels would be way higher, I think. Because the AI is predictable for the most part, you know? Yeah, because this this really flips the script on something like a like a hidden movement game. Absolutely. You've got, the, you've got the one versus many, but they're trying to stay hidden. This is like, no, one one versus many and I'm out to get you. Right. Yeah, like, yeah. And I, I love that. That actually sounds really fun. <laughs> yeah. Where that's uh, that hidden movement is not, you're trying not to find the one you're trying to not be found by the one. Yeah. After we, I mean, we just recently played a game of mind management and uh, just that whole turnaround. Yeah. That really intrigues I like that. me. Yeah. I like yeah. that a lot. That could be really cool for a, uh, an IP that I have next to zero interest in all of a sudden I'm very intrigued with this game. So yeah, I don't, I don't really do Halloween. I, it's, it's one of those things that I just don't get into, but yeah, yeah. Curse you, Andy. Cause now I'm, now I'm interested in this game. <laughs> so another game that should be hitting regular release pretty soon is last light. Last light is a two to four player game, a 45 to 75 minute playtime. Kickstarters of this should be fulfilling soon. So once that Kickstarter is fulfilled, you should start finding this in the wild. This is a, a fast-paced 4X game. I really enjoy the 4X games. However, some of them tend to drag on longer than I feel they're worth. So uh, this one I'm really excited about. Each turn, players are playing action cards to take simultaneous actions, exploring planets, mining for resources, gaining new technologies, and commanding a fleet, all while racing to the center of the rotating board to the last known white dwarf star to gather light for their civilization to survive. This is one that I'm really excited. I'd love to play this at some point. And I don't know if you've seen, like, like kind of do yourself a favor if you want. Like, go look at some pictures for this. The components for this look really good. And in particular, this is sort of designed to be illuminated It kind of in the dark, right? Yeah. yeah. That kind of place. It's not necessary. You don't have to do it. Like, this is not, not mandatory. But you can kind of riff on that whole light thing. The globes kind of, they kind of light up a little bit. So if you've got sort of that dim light or some LED light, you get kind of that nice spacey kind of feeling. You're heading toward that, that last source of of light in the universe i really like this if you're familiar with the dice tower at all this is a game that was uh, developed by roy Kennedy. so he is one of the members of the dice tower um he does some of their videos and some of their editing and and, and some of that kind of stuff and i'm i'm excited for him this is this is really cool uh it's been fairly successful and uh the, the plays of it look really fun uh pushed out there by gray fox games and it's one i'd love to play at a convention or something sometime I'm looking at some of these pictures where they have it in the low light where it's reflecting uh, with some direct illumination on it. I mean, even the dice. Yeah, this is a game where I'm mean, looking at our game topper here where you, we could just put in a strip of LED lights along the edge here and illuminate the board. It illuminates the dice. Yeah, that might be something. Uh, yeah, my, I mean, my table at home has the has the LED strip, so we could we could do this at my house and it'd be pretty fun. I might have to I might have to hunt to copy this down. You probably won't have to go too far. Sweet. So just saying, just <laughs> saying. I, I, I love it when you, I love it when you do that, Nathan. <laughs> oh, I'd really like to try this game. Well, guess what? It's on its way. <laughs> guess what? <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Well, if you liked the way Davy Jones Locker sounded, Nathan, and it sounded like you did when you liked it when we played it. Well, there is a new expansion that has, oh, been, really? has been announced already. And instead of fighting the Kraken, you're fighting the ghost ship. So there's cursed gold and all of those who have spent the cursed gold will be haunted by banshees and by the ghost ship and we can't fight back until we figure out and discover exactly how to defeat the ghost ship it's all new enemies all new crew members new equipment 
and new ways to try to defeat the enemy. So it it just adds up almost a whole different game element to what is already an awesome game. So I'm excited for this first expansion to come out. And so you have the Kickstarter version, right? I do, yes. So do you already have this expansion or is it No, this is not this ha- this not is part just, of the Kickstarter. Nope, it's not. It this was announced about a month ago. It's not Kickstarter yet. It's an, it's just an announcement, so. Wow. Yeah. Oh, look, that sounds pretty cool. I'm excited for that. Yeah. And I'm excited to play it. I haven't played this and I really want to. Yeah, we need to get you to the table to yeah, play this. Yeah, I, I, it looks really cool. So I have one last one that uh, I'm I'm intrigued with, and it's uh, something that's usually not in my wheelhouse because it's a one-player game, and this is called The Last Lighthouse. This is a game designed by Scott, Scott Alms, who uh, many are familiar with his Tiny Epic games or even... Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea, but this is it's a 10-minute game where you are the keeper of a lighthouse at the edge of the sea. Your light keeps the ship safe in the endless fog and terrible nights, but a threat approaches the lighthouse. Nightmares threaten to ten- tear down your tower. Are these real creatures? Or have you just been isolated way too long? Through your own madness, you must protect the lighthouse and keep it lit. Just the, the the plot, the story of this game has me kind of intrigued. Uh, and as a one-player game that's only 10 minutes, maybe that's something, uh, maybe it is one-player game that I will uh, pick up and actually play. Kind of a replacement for Solitaire. Kind of, yeah. Except for fun. Except for fun. Yeah. Right. I like it. All right. That takes care of games that has us excited on our radar, future games. So now let's talk about the pricey games. <laughs> uh, crowdfunding. <laughs> Our favorite time of the month. Well, one of our friends, Ryan Lockett, is kickstarting, has announced Kickstarter for one of his new games called Creature Caravan. And along with that, he's looks like he's re-releasing some of his previous games as well, which is kind of exciting. On this Kickstarter, I'm looking at his Kickstarter page, and it comes with a fifth and sixth player expansion. I'm really hoping that this, you know, it always makes me worried that when they add a fifth and sixth player expansion, that it's one of those that... Kind of an afterthought. Well, it's just one of those that, yeah, you can play at five and six, but doesn't necessarily you mean want to. that yeah. you should. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. hopefully that's not the case with this. It'll be interesting to see how this works. But Ryan does such a good job with the games that I own of his that he's that he's developed. And once again, he's done the artwork for it, and it looks amazing. Ryan does a good job. This is one where you're, you're navigating through it. You're trying to recruit creatures and uh, trying to safely navigate your caravan. Man, Ryan Lockett. Like, he's not a man. He's a machine. I know. I don't know how he does it. I'm telling you, like, he just cranks stuff out. Well, it's not even that he's he's not even just doing the game development. He's doing all the artwork. I I know. I don't know how he does it. I know. And, and, like, I still haven't touched, uh, not Distant Skies. Uh, What's the first one? Um, the, The one where you're out on the boat. Oh, sleeping um, gods, sleeping, sleeping gods. gods. Yeah. And I, that's one that we, we started to play. Absolutely loved it. We've got to get that to the table. He's got distant skies. He's working on. Yeah. He's got that whole, like a, uh, ab- above below now and never that whole near and, near far, and far. far. Yep. That whole series. And then he just keeps cranking out these, these games that actually look really good. And this looks like another hit for him. Yeah. Awesome. He's, he's got a, a little roll and ride on the here as well. That's it's called crystal miners. It's also on this small little roll and write game based on the same, the same world. And yeah, you're right. I, he's, he's, a, he's a machine. I don't know how he does it. Fantastic. That's awesome. Good for him. So I've got a, a, one more Kickstarter I want to talk about, and uh, it is a second edition. This is based on a, a fantasy war game called Alchemy. They've streamlined everything a little bit. So if those of you who are Alchemy fans out there that, that enjoy the, where you have, have a group of units, you're, you have different scenarios, everything in this is scenario based. So you'll pick a scenario to play and that's going to give you your, your units that you're going to play and you just go and fight. It's a, you know, a head to head war game that they've streamlined the rules and, and it looks like they've, they've made improvements and some extra developments to enrich the game without overcomplicating it. Um, I like when they do this, when they, Take a game, make a sec- the second edition better. It always makes me a little frustrated if, when you're a first edition person because you're like, dang it, what am I going to do with my first edition copy? Yep. I really want the second edition <laughs> copy now, you know? But I do like it when they can they can make, hopefully they come out with something where the people that owned it previously, they can get a kit or something like that to to not have to buy the entire game. I know a lot of, of these publishers will do that for their their previous supporters. So hopefully they do something like that with this one as well. Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Do you have do you have Alchemy First Edition? I don't, but it 
it does sound cool. I I like war games like this that are scenario based. It kind of reminded me of like a fantasy version of Memoir Forty Four. Honestly, right? As I was yeah, looking at it. I was kind of picking up that same vibe. Honestly, I didn't ever really play Memoir Forty Four until you and I had played it, Nathan. Mostly because it just it was a two player game, and I mean four players. I know it'll go up to four players, but it seems like one of those where like here, hold my hold my controller. Yeah, right. You know? Um, because it's really meant to be a two player game and it's it's not one that my wife would be interested at all in playing. Therefore I I just never picked it up. I did pick up the fantasy version of it and it just never gets to the table. But this one does sound fun. I mean if there was someone that was willing to play, I would be fun it would be fun to play. Nathan's I'm, I'm raising sound. my hand. All right. I am too. Yeah. This sound this Who me pick yeah. me. So are you backing this new version? I might. Yeah, it's it's still <clears throat> it hasn't been it's just coming soon. So it's just right. it's just uh announced, but yeah, I'll have to look at it closely and see what else is out there because that's really dependent on what I back is what else is out there because it seems like everything <laughs> hits at the same time. It yep. does. Yeah. Yep. We got to make those crowdfunding dollars stretch. You yep. sure do. <laughs> it's hard sometimes. Or you just don't back any of them. Yeah, which you keep talking about, but that's just a lie. <laughs> you're just a liar. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I really only had one that I wanted to talk about in the crowdfunding arena. Uh, this is a game called Mycelia. So this is a game all about mushrooms. And it really does look like a fantastic game. Amazing art and components. Mycelia is a dynamic game of tactics, a competition for space and resources to create your own mushroom kingdom. The game follows the life cycle of fungi, growing mushrooms to score points, sporing them, to expand your mycelial network. Wow, mycelial. I don't know if I've ever read that word before. Your mycelial network and eventually seeing them decay to unlock special actions. So this this really does look like a very cool game. It boasts short turns with a lot of strategic depth. Now, if a game can pull that off, I'm kind of in. I love that. Short turns that are really bursty, but that are still strategic and crunchy and, and fun. I really like that. It has a unique board. So the board gets laid out differently every single time. So lots of replayability and discoverability. Um, and then it also says there's a high player interaction. So you're, it's kind of a tableau builder with a lot of other like, like player interaction. Unlike a lot of tableau builders where it's just, hey, I, I'm doing my thing, you're doing your thing, and then we'll just see who scored the most at the end. So this looks like a really fun and intriguing game based on a really simple premise. You move, explore, you fruit your mushrooms, spore them, and then decay them for cool abilities. So this is a theme that, you know, I'll, I'll, most of us really, I think all of us really like themes, especially if they're implemented well. For sure. I would never have been intrigued by a mushroom themed game ever. <laughs> I that just I would never have even thought that, but it looks like they did a really good job with the implementation of the theme with this. I, it sounds kind of cool actually. Yeah. And, and you should definitely go check out the artwork. I mean, just, just at least go to the, to the Kickstarter page and just look at some of the cards and components and everything. This is one that gets me excited to just look at. Well, I know how you feel about second editions of things, but Doug, how do you feel about 1.5 edition of things? Uh, I, I have, I think I know where you're going with this and I have real mixed feelings. Yes, so Stars of Akarios 1.5 coming soon to Kickstarter near you. I'm wondering what they're changing. Is it is it just yeah. the errata where they're fixing a lot of the the grammatical? I mean, I know as we've played this, we there were some things that we had to go and and look up that needed to be fixed. I mean, yeah. So so I actually did a little research in this, and it wasn't bad. It was like a page of like they were mostly typos. That one scenario, I think it was scenario 57 or something like that. That one needed to be completely overhauled. But other than that. Um, there really weren't very many mistakes, or at least not in their frequently asked questions and errata page. There wasn't a whole lot to correct. That is part of what they're doing. So they are revising the rule book and fixing some of those things. Um, the big thing with this is they are adding a battles of Akarios mode. So this is basically where you just have a random setup and you just, you just fight. So it's not tied to the story or the campaign or anything. It's just lay the board out, put this stuff out there and just go. It also is introducing a, a book to introduce those scenarios. So instead of setting up the board with all the cardboard components and stuff, you just lay the board out, or the book out. Oh, okay. So th throw the book out, throw your ships on and just have a quick dog fight, which is cool, but I don't know that I would ever play it that way. Yeah. Is it going to, I mean, it's going to be like ring bound right so you're so you can flip mm -hmm. it open and so yep. you have to deal with that in the middle that could be mm -hmm. the, the the real double-edged sword of books like like right. that right is that yeah. uh, well and and then for me personally the other thing that i don't like about those books i know that they make setup easy but i don't like them because they're too small i mean even yeah. if it's a large print book 
it makes the play surface way too small. I don't like it. Yep. I agree. Cause I mean, even looking at, we just recently played stars of Akarios again and to try to have that dog fight on a board that is half that size. Yeah. No way. Cause you, there's, there's no way you're going to have a book that's twice that size. No. And I think what they've done, they've actually, so they've made the battlefield smaller. So I think the hexes and everything are still the same size, but the, it's just a small battlefield. So, yeah, you know, I like, okay. And, and, and that's cool. And, and I, you know, if, if you are just looking for an experience, I was actually thinking about this. If you want to just teach somebody how to do a dog fight, like if you're doing, you know, just a, how to play kind of yeah. thing, I could see pulling out a scenario of that and being like, Hey, here's how you play. We're just going to set this up. Let's go through the motions. Let's have a fight. And now we can jump into the campaign. The campaign is long enough that I'm probably going to get my Akarios fix playing through the campaign. In fact, it's one I really want to push to finish, but I think it's going to be a labor to get it to finish. And I don't know that I'm going to have much of a desire to just go play these sort of one-off little random battles. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's kind of like uh, getting the expansions to Gloomhaven where there's uh, even more content. And I mean, if you get through Gloomhaven, hats off to you. But yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, to, to have all that and then to have another... 10, 20 yeah. scenarios. Well, and these don't even tie into the story. This is like the little deck of cards, Gloomhaven, like where you can randomly create a, a dungeon and fight. That's like that's like what they're doing here. Yeah. So now I love Stars of Akarios. Absolutely. A, a fantastic game. And so definitely get in on this. If people are interested in the game, go check this out and go look at it. Um, having already owned the first edition, this 1.5 doesn't seem like it's adding anything I want to pay money for. The drones looked interesting. They didn't look game changing. Oh, remind me of the drones. So they added a couple of extra things. So they added some drones and then they changed some of the starting ships. So they gave them like a unique weapon and an engine upgrade to like kind of give them more of a unique oh, starting I think they build. did. Yeah, that's right. Just a balance. But it has more to do with balance. Than yeah. Anything. And so it, from what I was just quickly reading through it, it was just a little bit of a balance. But like I again, I don't know if it was like worth the price of basically buying the game over again. Yeah, you would definitely have to balance that out because you have, I know in our plays, there are definitely ships that are more suited to doing damage. And like my ship, granted, that's part of the things I've picked for my technologies, but just my abilities alone with my pilot and my ship, they're more toward being a support ship and being at a dogfight one-on-one. Yeah, I wouldn't want that ship. Yeah, Yeah. that's true. Yeah. Yeah. But But that's the fun of building out your squad, right? Is that you... You're, you're building these teams that can kind of go together. Now, one thing we haven't unlocked yet since we're doing this Akarios rabbit hole a little bit is as the game progresses, you do get multiple ships. So you will be able to build multiple ships and get different builds with those ships. So also pretty cool. So yeah. Okay. Maybe there's like a little bit of balancing stuff, but I, I mean, I've, we have hit the ground running with this game. We've been busting through the campaign and haven't had any issues. So unless they really introduce something big and game changing, I'm probably out on, on this one. Yeah. Or maybe if they just have a... Like an upgrade pack or something yeah, like that. If you, sure. All right. Well, that uh, that sounds like that's enough uh, crowdfunding for everyone's wallet. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, let's go ahead and call it call it there. Yeah, we've had lots of, lots of exciting news and um, lots of great games coming out. Some that have freshly come out and awesome ones that are in the future. Yeah, I think we're kind of in the time of year where there's a little bit of a lull, right? The, the summer peak has kind of hit. Um, a lot of people are taking their games to conventions and showing them there that it's, con- you know, convention season is here. And, and so there's a little bit of a preview of stuff to come, you know, it's, it's at the conventions, but it's not readily available, but it will be for the holiday push. And, and so there's a little bit of a lull typically around this time of year, but it, feels like there's still some pretty exciting stuff coming Absolutely. around the corner. Yeah. You know, I, I, we might be getting to a point where there's really never a lull, but yeah. it seems like, it seems like there's just always really fun stuff to look forward to in the board gaming hobby. And that's fun. That's exciting. Yeah. It's not like movies where they're competing against each other. Right. So there's so many new games coming out and even more pirate games for you and Andy and more Halloween games for you, Logan and more murder. Yes. I don't know. Every time I look at Kickstarter, <laughs> there's games competing. Because I have to choose only one. Yeah. But most of them still fun somehow. They do. It's, it's just usually not all me. <laughs> Which is surprising. <laughs> it really kind of is. <laughs> Unless it's Shadows of Brimstone. Yeah, I've got a problem. Or it's on the side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, on that note, until next time, we'll see you at the game table. Thank you for listening and being a part of Meeple Nation. If you would be so kind as to follow, subscribe, share, 
and rate or review this podcast. It really helps to spread the fun. You can be more involved in supporting the podcast by joining the nation at patreon.com slash meeplenation. Or you can find a link at the top of our webpage, meeplenation.com. And while you're there, look at all our extra content. There are links to all our past episodes, a wide variety of blogs, pictures from our Instagram feed, and bios for all the hosts and our awesome bloggers. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all under Meeple Nation. If you would like to chat with the hosts or other members of the nation, you can join our Facebook group, Meeple Nation Off Air. We hope to see you again at a game night, a con, or maybe a suspense-driven evening of werewolf. Thank you for listening and supporting Meeple Nation, and stay tuned for next week's episode. Thank you so much for listening. We very much want to thank our patrons who help keep the podcast running. I personally want to thank my co-hosts for all the help they provide with both content here on the podcast in addition to what we have available on our website. Without them, the podcast would not happen. If you too would like to support the podcast, you can join the nation at patreon.com forward slash meeple underscore nation. Or you can find a link to Patreon at the top of our webpage, meeplenation.com. If you have any questions, comments, or games you feel should be on our radar, you can always reach us at meeplenation at gmail.com. We can't wait to hear from you. I am grateful to Doug and Andy who helped me edit episodes. And I want to thank James and Kim Clark who do the editing on our blogs and on our webpage, which can be found at meeplenation.com. We want to thank Brain Detergent for our music. If you want to find more from him, you can follow his links that can be found on our webpage or simply search for Brain Detergent on YouTube to find more of his tracks. Thank you again for listening and being part of the Meeple Nation community.